What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares and set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys that was in Leavenworth with and others who survived their own nightmare. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that'll help you knock down some of the prisons you built up in your own mind. All right, Nightmare Success in and out listeners, we are back with a special edition. This one is not your normal uh, Nightmare Success podcast because Marvin Cotton, one of my all-time favorite uh, interviews, if you guys are playing the board game, he was on uh, a few months ago and one heck of a story. If you if you remember, Marvin uh, was sentenced to life without parole in... Um, as an innocent man and served uh, 19 years, seven months, 12 days. And there is a, a big case that's going on. Uh, it's a hearing with Lamar Johnson. And one of the cool things about this is, is this is a, I call these exoneree uh, crusaders because these guys, they follow around and, and it's a group. I mean, there's, there's a lot of these people out there that were wrongly convicted of murder and were finally released. And if, if you guys are listening to the most recent um, podcast that came out Thursday, Daryl Burton is one of those guys. He served 24 years and finally got free. Um, but anyway, I want to welcome everybody in. Marvin Cotton, welcome, my man. Hey. Good to have hey, it's you. It's an honor, always an honor. Uh, and then I've got Ken Nixon down here in the corner. We're on a little Zoom here. Ken did 16 years and finally is sitting in front of us as a free man. And then Eric Anderson, who was nine years. And uh, you guys are, I th are you all from the Michigan area? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. We yeah. are from Detroit, Michigan. Well. And if I'm not mistaken, and I might be wrong about this, but I think I'm somewhat right. Um, there was an integrity unit put in play. Uh, was it three or four years ago? I can't remember the time period, but there was like 34. About three and a half years Three and ago, a half years? Almost four. And am I right about the number? There was like 34 men that have been released since that integrity unit was put into play? Yeah. It's up to about 36 now. But, wow. but you, you, you pretty much on point. So guys, tell me, you've, you've actually been sitting in um, the hearing every day with Lamar uh, the Lamar Johnson hearing, and uh, man, it, it, it makes your head spin when you hear uh, what happened. And and uh, but it but what is interesting though is that you find out as you read through all these different cases like this, it's not unusual. It's just one of these cases that this happened this way. What do you? What's your all's take on on uh, Lamar Johnson and what uh, is going on this week in the courtroom? I think what we're seeing in, in Lamar Johnson's case is historic. Um, the judge is no nonsense. You know, he's not tolerating any rhetoric. Um, the repetitive behavior that you typically see uh, in, in these types of hearings, um, the judge is definitely not tolerating it. I think the other, the, just from the visual effects of what we're seeing in the courtroom, like it's not very often that you see a local prosecutor team up with an innocence project no. to free somebody no. like that, that that's, that's a new one, but it's also a trend that you're starting to see around the country where you have like-minded people that are really trying to see justice served. Right. It's not about stacking convictions. It's about getting it right. Um, as, as long as there's an innocent person in prison, there's a true killer that is free to roam the streets and victimize society. Uh, People like Kim Gardner, uh, Trisha Bushnell Rojo, uh, these are people that are, are true advocates, they're true fighters. And to see both of them in what would traditionally be an adversarial position to be on the same team now is, is monumental. And I think there was a new law that was passed in 2021 in Missouri that this couldn't have even taken place. Uh, before that, before they uh, pass this new statute, where new people could, or people could actually have these hearings uh, before a judge, and that's uh, you know Missouri's a little bit behind on the curve here from from a lot of other states, but at least we're getting into a situation where these 
these cases can be heard. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's that's interesting in and of itself is because, you know, in Michigan, for example, um, we didn't have to go through the legislator to put some law on the books to tell prosecutors um, that they can do something that the law doesn't prevent them from doing. Um, and, and we should never put politics before innocence. Uh, we should never put the value of a dollar um, on innocence. So when we see that type of thing, when we've sat in prison for so many years being innocent, you know, that's that's like one of the most ugliest sights to us. Um, you know, we don't get paid to be here. Uh, we don't have any um, um, personal interest with the exception of wanting to see justice and someone not go through something that we went through. Right. Um, you know, but the fact that it even had to be a battle to say, um, um, you know, here in Missouri with with Kevin Strickland and Lamar Johnson case, they put in procedure over innocence. Right. Wait, and you bring At up moment, Kevin Strickland, as, Marvin, was he released last year? Yeah. Yes. And that was in the Kansas yes, City yes. area. Yeah, absolutely. We started coming down here. Um, uh, for Kevin Strickland as well as Lamar Johnson um, last year. And we've been advocating heavily for them as well as prisoners all over the country, um, you know, in Ohio, uh, Indiana, Michigan, of course. Um, we've had um, several hearings um, that we participated in and testified in on behalf of um, men that we believe are innocent back home in Michigan. So we're here in Missouri right now. Um, but we're still on Zoom calls and 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 trying to advocate and help people back in Michigan get out of prison as well. Yeah. Innocent people that's in prison as, as well as get them resources. Yeah, because you're putting a voice to it and, and that's what has to be done. I, I've had several friends call and talk about it because the, you're, the timing of uh, Daryl Burton's um, podcast this week and then you guys being in town, uh, it's got a conversation going within – groups in, in uh, St. Louis here about, wow, how does this happen? Can you guys give the high points of what you see went wrong in this case, LeBar Johnson's case? I think different that. things stand out for all of us, but Ken, definitely uh, start that off. <laughs> uh, we, we were just I, talking about this. Yeah, we, we definitely were just talking about this. I, I think um, the, the number one issue is – the, the misidentification. Uh, historically, statistically, we have uh, what can be considered a highly, highly red flag when it comes to identification. Uh, statistically, cross-racial identification is inherently suspect. Um, not only is it inherently suspect in this particular case, that same witness is now coming forward saying, I screwed up. Like, I, I, I'm sure I didn't see what I saw when I said I saw what I saw. So now you're put in a situation where this is a, a double misidentification. He, he, he's telling you he did wrong and it's cross racial where we know this has been ineffective throughout the years. The other thing that is, is you can't bypass is the government misconduct. You have documented evidence that the government compensated the witness to do what they needed him to do at that particular time without it, it on the record. It's been stated Without that witness, there's no case against Lamar Johnson. Right. So without the incentive to testify, there is no witness for Lamar Johnson. Lamar Johnson doesn't go to prison. So, I mean, you, when you combine those two things for me, there is no case here. Mm. Marvin, you're on uh, mute. There you go. Yeah. yeah. And for me, um, along the same lines, because it, it's kind of hard to find many points although we can find many points within the same issue because literally the only thing um, that they had in order to charge and convict him was this particular witness. Um, and the witness said that the two men that he seen had ski masks on and with the eyes cut out. So right. he made identification with what you see here. This area right in here is where he made his identification that sent the man to prison for the rest of his life. Mm. So, um, um, in his first two uh, lineups, he didn't pick anybody out. Right. And he went, and according to his own testimony and his affidavit, but according to his own testimony, uh, when he told the officers that he didn't, he can't pick anybody out, um, he asked the office, he asked the detective, well, who do you want me to pick out? 
you tell me who you want to pick out and I'll say it. He actually said this. And the detective, according to this witness, said, um, pick three and four. And he said, okay, three and four. And that's exactly what he did. And that should never rob a man of 28 years of his life. That shouldn't rob, that shouldn't rob a, a person for 28 minutes of their life. Right. That right. didn't even warrant a conversation because that wasn't um, a real identification. Well, and I think you know, one of the things that identification, uh, Marvin, I think one of the things that, that is so important is to bring light to this because I think everybody, if they woke up in the middle of the night, one of their biggest nightmares would be to be identified in a police lineup and not be guilty. And, and, and especially if you're talking about something like murder, you know, that, that carries life without parole, that, that is, has got to be ranked in the top one, two, three of somebody's nightmare of how do you, how do you deal with that after that happens? Because, you know, going back to, uh, uh, Daryl Burton situation. Uh, his thing, he, th he wasn't even in town when it happened. And the person who misidentified him, uh, the characteristics was the person was five, four, five, five, and he's five, 10, five, 11. There's a light skinned person. Daryl was a, was a dark skinned person. So everything was wrong, but it didn't matter. It only took 30 minutes for that deliberation to happen with the jury. And, uh, he ended up to go to the the 47 bloodiest acres in, uh, in, in America is what Time Magazine dubbed it at the time. That That's the thing, you know, what, what, you, what you guys are doing, bringing light to this, it's, it's got to stay, there's got to catch momentum to it because, and I think, you know, what you were saying, Ken, I think there is some momentum to it. I, I feel like that we're talking more about it now than we have. I, I just feel like there's some type of general conversation like um, was said. I don't think you see a situation where you've got the uh, Missouri attorney general and, and the St. Louis attorney that, that are on opposite sides of the fence here. That doesn't really happen very often unless you're, you've got some momentum behind the situation of that, that is so out of bounds. It's just so far out that you're like, man, we got to do something about this. Absolutely. And you want to go, Eric? Yeah, I was going to go. Um, with that being said, that's part of the reason why we're here. We're here to bridge the gap, you know, um, to put a face to the issue. The issue is that they need progressive prosecutors. They need conviction integrity units. They need people that cares about the issue at hand. There's no reason why Lamar Johnson should still be sent to prison after 28 years. And they know that the identification was suggestive. They know that he was compensated for this testimony. It's nothing that signifies that he did this other than the person that was paid to make a statement to say, yes, Lamar is the one that did it. Other than that, what do they have? There should be more. They have an attorney general. Right. There should be way more. They have an attorney general fighting the conviction. So you're just going to fight every conviction. I mean, you're going you're gonna to fight every um, re re conviction re redo. Like, let the man know. Why, why, why are you fighting justice? You know, um, part of their duty is to stand on justice, to make sure justice will serve. Justice will not serve. So now give this man justice that from the injustice that y'all gave him. Yes. And I think that's one of the other things that's really tough is, is that once you're put into the system, and once you're convicted, it is so tough to untangle that. It, it is almost like, you know, just you're trying to you're trying to change something that the system as, you know, a huge weight is you got to push it back up and, and try to, to scurry underneath it to get through. And man, that's a tough lift. What's what's even what's even more unique about Lamar's situation though, Lamar and Kevin Strickland, what's even more unique? Um, specifically to them is we're looking at a situation where it's the government fighting the government. Yes. About somebody's life. Like when you boil this down to what's happening in this courtroom, it's the government fighting the government. Somebody's life hangs in the balance because the government can't figure out who's right and who's wrong. Right. That man's life is hanging in the balance right now over politics. Literally. I don't think it gets any, you can't, 
simplify it any more than that. And then to go back to an earlier point that you made uh, about this new law in Missouri. Yes, this is a historic law. This is something that changes the landscape, the legal landscape in Missouri. But how many people had to die before that law was passed? How many people suffered through prison since and died in prison or on Missouri death row before there was an avenue to actually prove innocence in the state of Missouri? That's that law was passed in 2021. There's a lot of people that didn't make it to see 2021. A lot of innocent people that didn't make it to see 2021. So, guys, what? Um, so a lot of. Oh, go ahead, Eric. Sorry. I'm about to say, I'm about to say a lot of innocent people that ain't lived to see the age of 21 in the free world. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's a deep, a deep thought when you think about it that way. That, you know, there's so many people that actually being innocent in an environment that they obviously didn't choose and shouldn't have been there died in there. And it's, uh, that's disturbing beyond what disturbing can mean. But guys, what is the, what, if somebody's listening to this, what, what should they be doing? Um, you know, we, we're very big on accountability. Um, and the only people that can hold um, a government agency or entity um, accountable is the people. So that starts with awareness. That starts with um, educating uh, ourselves with um, what should be happening, uh, what we want to see happening. And, 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 and after awareness becomes engagement, people have to engage uh, elected officials. They have to engage those that are sitting in seats that are that have control over the masses of our lives. Like we have to engage. So what we do is we put a face to it. Um, we, we give as much education as we can. And then we hit the ground and we get in our cars and we drive and we get on airplanes and we actually come out here and, and engage with people. Uh, we know that the government was set up on the premise um, of the people by the people. Um, and we really believe that. Um, even though a lot of our experiences prove otherwise, we're going to hold to what the Constitution say and we're going to hold people to account. And every member of society have that same obligation, responsibility and duty. Hold hold our elected officials accountable. Yeah. No one will want to lay in their bed every night while their family member and they know that their family member is innocent, sitting in a cold prison cell. Only we can change that. Only the public can engage um, government in a way, um, you know, yes, they, they are endowed with this power that we give them. We have to hold them accountable and check it. When we see they're not doing something right, they have to be held accountable and only we can do it. That has nothing to do with um, Republican or Democrat, um, progressive or conservative. It has nothing to do with that because innocence don't have a political party. I got that from my brother, Ken Nixon. <laughs> uh, innocence don't have a political party. It does not. Um, and, 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 and people have to stop siding with politics when it comes to human life, because it could easily be you. Anytime the government get away with doing the wrong thing, that just mean it just made it easier for them to do it to you. Yep. Good point. Really good point. And for, for those that, um, are not engaged in the political aspect of it. There's other ways that you can get involved as well. There's criminal justice reform organizations all across this country. There's national ones, there's local ones, there's statewide ones. Um, there's always something to do. There's always something, whether it's volunteering on the weekends or donating money or lending yourself to uh, being able to, to lend a helping hand, making copies. There's innocent organizations all over the country. Uh, Innocence Projects take volunteers. They take interns for college students. There's all sorts of ways. That we're nonprofit. You know, the work that we're doing is it, self-funded, right? There's there's all sorts of, of startups that are, are showing up. Criminal justice reform, to be honest, is, is sexy right now. Everybody's talking about criminal justice reform. I guarantee you there's a space for anybody, and it doesn't make a difference you know, what you're gifted at, whether it's, you know, web design or creative stuff, there is a space for you in this industry. We need help. 
lawyers, um, progressives, conservatives. Conservatives have a voice in this movement, whether you believe it or not. Conservatives have a voice, right? It, if everything was all one sided, we would never get anywhere. We need to hear from people. We need to hear the good, the bad, the ugly. That's how we make change in this country by respecting each other's opinions and coming to a compromise. There's a space for everyone here. But when it comes to issues of innocence, I don't think there's a compromise when it comes to that. Nobody should die in prison for a crime that they didn't commit. That It's just, it's hurtful to think about that this is what our country is still talking about going into 2023, that there's innocent people locked in cages that can do nothing about it themselves. And yeah, we know Lamar Johnson's name. We know Kevin Strickland's names. But what about all the names we don't hear? What about all the names that don't bubble to the top, right? I mean, that's it takes advocates. It takes people to get off their couches and do something about it in order to change the system. So I would say for everybody that's listening, if you're sitting on your couch and you want to get involved, find a way. There's always a way. I was going to say, follow up on that too, Ken, is, is that the one scary thing that I see in our society right now is that we are narrow casting. You know, the people listen to what they want to listen to, go to the place that only hears what they want to hear. And I think for us to break through this is that we've got to get away. Communication has to be hearing each other so that uh, the movement can be what it needs to be. Um, you know, I, I hope that the pendulum starts swinging back to normality with people just being able to talk, you know, just being able to discuss important issues without one being evil. You know, this is, we're talking about real things that need to change. And the only way to do that is, is to have conversations about it. And it's, it's, it's gotta be that way, or it doesn't swing the pendulum the right way. I agree. I, I definitely agree. Um, two way communication, effective listening, compromise, uh, these are all things that we need, especially, especially in the wrongful conviction community. Uh, being able to listen to each other and really hear what the other side is saying is, is we have to compromise. We have to. Do you think there's issues, too, of and, and do you guys think it's changing where, you know, a narrative takes one path? And they go down that path and they don't investigate what they should be investigating and, and more for the expediency of, of, you know, you get a conviction, you get a promotion, you get a conviction, you get uh, movement. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's been a lot of, um, what should I say? It, it's it, the, the freedom to be able to do that and, and, and at, tell somebody, you know, to, Hey, that's, it's three and four, but, as far as their job security and what happens if that conviction happens, it's usually in a positive thing that happens, you know, it's another notch, another conviction, you know, the further we get away from that, the further the justice is just for justice instead of what it does for you in the system. Uh, you know, cause I feel like that goes all the way up. I mean, I, I think the, the justice department all the way through from the local level, all the way to the federal level, there's, there's a, there's a piece there that needs to be balanced back to that. There's some harm. If you cause harm, that shouldn't be something that goes unreprimanded and unnoticed. There's most certainly no accountability on behalf of the government and the when it comes to criminal justice, when it comes to justice period, there's no, absolutely no accountability. Um, they are protected by law and their job security. And I think, you are correct. It perpetuates the problem. Historically, it perpetuates the problem. When there's no accountability, it leaves them with the freedom to be as destructive and harmful as they wish. And in some situations, it even incentivizes them to do so. Uh, when you boil down this bigger problem of no accountability, um, it's about case numbers, right? Solving crime. The, 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 the police, as we know, are pressurized sometimes they're incentivized to solve cases statistics show that historically you know closing cases and and case rates are have been historically low so the pressure from the top to bring those numbers up causes people sometimes to do things that shouldn't be done are unjust and i think that that's um 
that's something that that there's a lot of good police officers out there putting their life on the line. You know, I've, I I know that. But for those 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 few that take away people's freedom, and 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 put innocent people away, those are the you know there has to be accountability for that. And without that, I think the system doesn't quite close the gap because what it does is it puts a it puts unjustly a black mark on the good men do, and good women doing good things out there, uh, trying to protect the communities, trying to do the good things because they do. But for the people that don't, it it uh, without them having accountability, it 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 gives a black mark, and and unfairly, to to the whole. And I think the more that we could close that gap, so that those people are held accountable, but the rest are recognized for the great job they do, would also be a, a great turn in the in the wheel. I want to highlight one point when it comes to that because I know Marv and Eric want to jump in on this one, but let me highlight one extremely very important point. When it comes to the police, right, we hear this narrative about, you know, it's one bad apple or it's two bad apples. That was just a bad cop. What we never hear is the good cops getting rid of the bad cops. Right. If you know that person is bad, why is it on society? Why is it society's responsibility to discover this when you knew it was happening for 20 years? Yep. If you don't want that black mark on your name, then you do something about it. Right. Um, why is it left to society? to come back later on and discover that 30 years later, this guy had a, a documented history of being a bad cop. Yep. You knew it all along and you did nothing to address it. So in my opinion, it makes the good cops look just as bad as the bad cop because you knew it was happening. And you did nothing to address it. Complicit. So, I mean, it, yep. it, it exactly. It's complicit behavior. Yep. And then everybody cries out about, well, it was just one bad person. Well, you knew it was happening. Right. So why didn't you do anything about it? If you didn't want that, to blow back on your name, you should have addressed it years before. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He pretty much um, stole my point. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, we, we've kind of we've we, we've we've suffered under some of the same some of the same things. So, um, I, I, and I know it's kind of hard for a, a lot of people in society not to really understand that, and we understand that. Um. Um. You know, our experience uh, we had in, in our cases, all of our cases, as well as uh, a lot of other exonerees that we represent and cases that we follow. Um, all of those cases had um, corrupt, um, um, bad detectives, not bad detective work. Right. No intentional right. Um, decisions, intentional things being withheld, intentional things being done, um, lies being injected, not starting with. Uh, witnesses, but starting with detectives. Um, and it's not one detective in Detroit. Um, you know, there's been many detectives in Detroit that have led to many wrongful convictions. Some of those detectives, you know, dozens, dozens of cases out of Chicago, um, Illinois, and, and New York, where um, a, just a couple of detectives had hundreds of wrongful convictions thrown out. Um, but it's hard for uh, bad cops to exist when they're existing amongst a lot of good cops. Agreed. Agreed. Um, we, we need human beings to really step up. Yeah. I think going into 2023 and beyond, we really need good human beings on every level, whether they're a police officer or not. We, we work with law enforcement um, um, doing speaking engagements at high schools. Mm -hmm. So so we're not anti-cop or anything like that. Uh, we come to the table and give our suggestions and put our two cents in um, every opportunity we get, not only to make a better department because, you know, they public servants, they work they work for us, um, uh, but, but also to help make a better department for, for everybody. So we come to the table if they have a nonprofit or organization that they're working with, uh, we come to the table. So so we're not anti-cop. However, uh, we don't accept injustice on no level from anybody, um, you know, any fear that any of us had. Um, got left a long time ago <laughs> when it burnt away into this, you know, in, in, in the, in, in the, um, the experiences that we undergone, but we use our fearlessness. Um, and, 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 and we really give our fearlessness, um, like a charity to society. And we, and we do and say what people won't do and say for the greater good of everybody. Yep. I love that kind of going around the horn here, wrapping up anything else you guys want to get out there while we're talking this up. You know, I would just like to say, 
I would just, I would just like to say, not not to that point, not anything to that point. I would like to say, um, man, I love St. Louis. All right, I man. love Missouri. <laughs> um, I think we all can agree to um, when we first came down here, it was a challenge. Yeah, you know, we all from Detroit, but we we had faith and we had confidence in ourselves, in our story, in our desire to want to change the world, to keep coming around to. Uh, invest our time and our resources into bettering Missouri. You know, um, I know it's one step at a time. We still got a whole lot of work to do, but I can vouch for all of us that we invested to trying to change Missouri one step at a time. That's a big deal. And, and you know, the fact that you guys are doing what you're doing is so cool because you are giving a face to the problem. And, um, that's probably more important than anything. You know, giving a face and giving a voice to something that people need to know. They might not want to know. I mean, I think it scares people to, to think that these things can happen because if that means if it can happen to you, it can happen to them. And I think sometimes that's hard for people to face. It scares them. True. And it makes it easy for people to ignore. That's what, that's what makes it easy for people to ignore what you just said right there. Marvin, let's talk about your book. I've been I've been looking. Uh, Better not broken is is running oh, wow. running wild on uh, Amazon in the number one category. Way to go, man! Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you know, I talk about a lot of what we've been through, but you know, more about my personal experience, just the pain of, and and you know about it as well, just the pain of being incarcerated, um, being there, um, you know, wrongfully convicted, the the mental anguish, the emotional damage, the loss of um, relationships. I lost maybe ninety five percent of my relationships in my first year of being incarcerated. So you, here I go, I you know, in there for something I didn't do, and I'm losing everything. Um, so my book is a way of giving back and, and, and bringing, you know, more and more awareness to these issues that we're talking about now here today. I'll tell you this is that one of the things about this podcast is what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality. How do you adapt? How do you survive? And I think the other part of it is, is that after you adapt, survive, how do you use your experience? You guys are using your experience for the good. You're making a difference. And uh, man, if you guys just keep doing that, uh, we need to put an umbrella over the United States to make this stuff happen. So I want to thank you for what you do, um, you know, with your podcast and, and, and showing how um, a, a directly impacted person can come out of that accident um, and start a process of repairing themselves and become a success. Um, and in a lot of cases, um, like almost everybody that I've seen, um, if not every single uh, episode I've seen that you've done, you've highlighted um, these amazing success stories that don't even compare to people that haven't never even experienced that type of impact. Um, so, so I love what you're doing. You're giving a voice, you're putting the, um, um, uh, the right face on, on what change looks like and, and giving it a voice. And I appreciate you sharing this, um, your, your platform with exonerees. Absolutely. I appreciate that, Marvin. Well, guys, thanks for coming to St. Louis. Uh, Eric, thanks for the shout out for St. Louis. St. Louis needs that. Appreciate that. I appreciate you for making it happen. <laughs> All right, Marvin, Ken, Eric, thanks for coming to St. Louis. Thanks for giving your voice. Thanks for uh, supporting Lamar Johnson, and hopefully we can get this guy home before Christmas. Absolutely, and we'll see you soon. All right, guys. We'll see you soon. Be good. Yes, sir.